Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Stephen Marquardt and I work in the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town and it's my pleasure to welcome you to UCT today. Um, so we haven't hosted this for a little while and so I'm glad that it's come back here. These meetings go back in fact to about 2005 or 2006 and I remember one of the earliest meetings we held at UCT was with UNISA and uh, probably Northwest and there were a few enough of us that we sat around a table in our an old chemistry library meeting room and it was a bit like a safety blanket because we were doing new and scary things with open source and we were reassuring ourselves along the way and also um, figuring out how to do this together and plan and work together. And it's really a pleasure to see how these events have grown over the years, both in the number of people and the breadth of participants, but also in the range of topics and the way they have matured into becoming a community of practice where we get together and share things across a wide range of areas of interest in educational technology and e-learning and uh, education in general. So I must start with a, a particular thanks to Open Collab because Open Collab has taken on the sort of mantle of organizing these over the last numbers of years and they provide um, very, very valuable continuity. So it's been co-hosted between Open Collab and host institutions, but the experience and history with Open Collab makes it um, relatively easy to host these events. So a great um, vote of thanks to Open Collab and LCB in particular for um, the continuity that you provide and your service to higher education and our universities. Um, from the UCT side, you all would not be sitting here without my colleague Sam. Where is Sam? Yes, yeah, Sam. <laughs> so I think Sam signed us up to host this in the first place and then did all of the actual organization. Um, and so a particular vote of thanks to her. Um, to visitors who've traveled from far away, particularly Ian at the back from the Perio Foundation, and Chuck, who has so many hats, I never know how to introduce them. Racing car driver, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, who's probably come the furthest. Uh, to our remote presenters particularly, some of whom are in time zones that aren't really friendly to presenting here. And to the Emerge Africa Network, with whom we are partnering to live stream some of these events to an audience that's um, throughout Africa. So thanks to the people there who helped arrange that. To some of my colleagues in Silt, particularly, who helped with logistics um, on the streaming and remote presentations, uh, Raya Libabalo, Devin um, Sita for managing presenter consent, Shanali, and some of our staff in the admin team. Um, so some logistics quickly. We will be streaming some of the events, live streaming, uh, and that URL has been sort of publicly advertised and more specifically within the Emerge Africa Network. We have a back channel that we'll be taking questions from, so um, we'll relay those to presenters in the same way as we'll take questions from people here. Um, we are also recording the talks, but we also don't wish to uh, inhibit anything that you might wish to ask that you don't want there to be a permanent record of. So if you ask a question or have some interaction and you would like it edited out of the final published presentations, which will be up on YouTube, or as a presenter you want to edit your <coughs> recording slightly, we are happy to do that for you. Just let us know before the end of the conference. Um, we, if you have laptops, there are actually power plugs under the desk. You might not have seen them, but they're like hidden. You can find them. You stick your hand underneath. Um, on Wednesday afternoon, there is an opportunity to visit our offices on Upper Campus, the Silk offices. If anybody would like to see the um, studio facilities that we have, we've talked about the One Button Studio, and that's on the program as well. So if you would like to visit us on Wednesday afternoon at the same time as the Tsugi workshop, if you're not signed up for that, then um, chat to Sam probably is the best thing to do. And I think that's the end of logistics. Okay, so um, I'd like to invite Elsebi or Martelian. Martelian to welcome you from Open Collab. Okay, well, thank you, Stephen. Um, I can only echo what you said already. Uh, welcome, everyone. 
certainly is good to see a large number of you yet again here on the 13th occasion of Sakai. Uh, Open Colab also in its first lifetime involved, has been involved with Sakai since 2006-2007, so it has been a partnership that has come a long while as well. Um, just also welcome, welcoming uh, Chuck and Ian traveling from far, but also the people from Porch and Pretoria and uh, Joburg, Ermelue, it's also quite far to travel to get to Cape Town. You're very welcome. Uh, a special thanks from my side to Elsebi and Sam for organizing this event. I think they took the lion's share upon themselves to get this done, organized. Uh, and thank you, UCT, for hosting us and uh, being our co-host. Thanks for your involvement as well, Stephen. Um, I think it's pretty simple, the logistical arrangements. We have coffee, tea, and lunch outside. Uh, the function tonight is at the Wild Fig. Uh, you can Google the uh, location. If you don't want to Google it, you can ask Elsabi or myself or Sam or Stephen. I think we all pretty much have a good idea of where, of where that is. Um, the bathrooms are just around the corner. And then, as Stephen said, there will be some virtual presentations. These sometimes can be challenging to get going, but um, uh, I believe everything has been tested up front, so this year it's going to work. Thank you very much, and welcome. Thanks, and I believe next up is Ian Dolphin for introduction of the Perio Foundation updates. There was light. Thank you very much for those kind words. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm Ian Dolphin. I'm Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Foundation and some of its priorities shortly. Uh, background, um, I worked in higher education in the UK for a long time as Head of East Strategy at the University of Hull, and I was uh, an early member, although not a founding member, of the Sakai board, and also an organization called JSIC back in the, uh, the last decade. So I've had about 20 years' experience of working in open source in higher ed, which is why I look so old. I want to... <laughs> Lovely picture from, uh, from last year in Pochefstroom. This photograph contains a very valuable teaching point, which I want to begin with. Can anybody guess what that is? Chuck Severance is not allowed to answer that question. The important teaching point is if you're in a group photograph, don't stand in front of Dr. Chuck. <laughs> Otherwise, you tend to get things like tiny sakaigas put on the top of your head. <laughs> so that's a valuable lesson for everybody for later, I, I hope. So it's difficult to talk about all the work that Aperio does in 45 minutes. We've grown from being a few software communities like Sakai and uPortal into being 17 software communities. We are part of a network that includes the ASAP Portai Consortium in France and the LAMP Consortium in North America of small colleges. So all in all, a network of around 160 higher education institutions and commercial partners. And those commercial partners like Open Colab are incredibly valuable to our ecosystem because what I'm about to say is open source is about choice for higher education and having commercial partners and commercial affiliates increases the amount of choice that universities have. But why should we, why should higher ed choose open? Well, 15 years ago, Paul Curran, who was then librarian at the University of Michigan, undertook a study uh, which interviewed literally hundreds of leaders of higher ed institutions who'd chosen open source, 
and they pinned the choice of open around three things. Cost is the obvious one. I'll say a little bit more about cost in a moment. Suitability, many of them indicated that they believed that higher ed was often faced with commercial proprietary offerings that were designed for business, not for higher education. And more importantly, I think, and it's something I want to expand on, control. And that control element covered everything from not being forced to upgrade your software when a commercial proprietary vendor said you had to upgrade your software, to the ability to, to innovate. So open source software is not free from cost, but it's free from licensing cost. What you spend on open source software as an institution is an investment. It's about increasing institutional capacity. And open source software is flexible and adaptable. You can adapt it to your institution's purposes. Uh, it's important to note that um, while you can modify open source software to meet those institutional needs, it's important to recognize that you don't want to do that to the extent where you're actually creating an in-house solution. Uh, in the language of, an, of open source communities, that's a, a called a software fork. You create a version that essentially you have to do a lot of work on to maintain. So it's important to get the balance right. And I want to give you an example from New York University, uh, an example that is based around Sakai. So NYU were quite late adopters of Sakai. They adopted Sakai in 2013, or moved to Sakai in 2013. They have run a series in alternate years of faculty consultations and student consultations uh, to assess what the pain points were in the software and what folks wanted developing more. NYU have helped to create solutions. They've integrated those solutions to the problems with uh, the broader Sakai com community. And they've deployed, progressively deployed a solution that meets user needs much more closely. And there's evidence to back up this work. So if you look back over a year in, We've got the somewhat dissatisfied, dissatisfied, and very dissatisfied 24%. Incidentally, if you look at figures from similar institutions for commercial proprietary solutions, quite often you find dissatisfaction rates of 35 and 40%, which is interesting in itself. But over the course of several years, the work that I've just outlined has actually led to significantly greater satisfaction against those initial findings. But if you compare then NYU's satisfaction rates to dissatisfaction rates that Educause uh, is an organization of uh, higher ed IT folks in the United States, you find that there's a very significant difference between the NYU results and the national work, uh, national results from Educause. NYU could not have done this work with a commercial proprietary solution or an otherwise locked down solution. Their ability to modify, to continue to test and modify the code is how they've managed to achieve those satisfaction rates. I mentioned choices earlier. Open source offers you several choices. You can choose to host open source in-house. You can host it externally on commodity infrastructure, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that later. You can buy service provider assistance to help you with integration. Uh, you can get a hosted solution, uh, or you can collaborate around external commodity infrastructure. And really, what that NYU work shows, I think, is the ability of an institution to innovate collaborate with other institutions to fix problems and provide new solutions. And it really is focusing your investment on mission delivery. How many people have heard the expression next generation digital learning environment? Our acronyms are getting progressively worse and worse. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we need some kind of acronym non-proliferation treaty, I, uh, I, I think. NGDLE is difficult to say.
we, uh, we started to call it Nigel partway through last year. Uh, I think it's probably a better name. And you can also get, those of you who are of my age, we remember making plans for Nigel by XTC from the uh, 1970s, I believe it was. Um, next generation digital learning environment is this positive future where the barriers around the learning management system as a product category start to erode and it becomes much easier to integrate tools into the learning environment and the consequence is a greater degree of flexibility. Dr. Chuck's going to talk some more about that in detail later today, so I'm not going to try even try to steal his, uh, his thunder. Um, I think the point is that if you look at schools like NYU, uh, Notre Dame, Duke, in our community, you can see the beginnings of that NGDLE in practice. And the fact that Sakai is an open environment, an open source environment, is a key enabler of that work. To offer a slightly different perspective on innovation, we use uh, a lot of metaphors in uh, software development. Uh, architecture is one of them. Who's come across a writer called Stuart Brand? Anyone? Oh, sorry, this is going to be news. I was, I was worried that I was going to be uh, too predictable. So Stuart Brand, in a book called How Buildings Learn, which I would recommend to all of you, makes the point that every building is a prediction and every prediction is wrong. Now, there's an interesting group of architect, physical building architects called Aut Architecture who suggest that instead of trying to anticipate the perfect building for a specific moment in time, they want flexible constructions that can adapt over time. I think this is an absolutely critical element to understand in trying to reach out for that next generation digital learning environment. They suggest it's an attempt to integrate time with design. Everybody involved in education sees the learning management system. Some people see it as the be all and end all. We almost certainly know that it is not the last word. In many senses, it's the first word around e consistent e-learning. And it's a, an entity, an, um, a construct, which has to be made to evolve over time to better suit needs. Open source software can enable that evolution, but we need to do some stuff to make sure it does. We need design affordances like common specifications and standards to enable the pieces to plug together and work together. There's a lot of work we have to do. But I would say that open source software is at least as important to the realization of the NGDLE as open standards. Uh, commercial proprietary software vendors and the term open source, people who pretend to have an open source license or have an open source license that isn't really open, are they likely to disaggregate their systems? Will they allow us in higher education to pull them apart and put them together more flexibly? I would argue probably not. But again, that, that NYU story is about evolution in close proximity to user needs. Discovery of user needs, fixing problems, being able to fix problems. And it's about shortening the loop between innovation and realization and working in an open source community like this to achieve those ends. What's the alternative to this? Well, the alternative is, quite frankly, uh, and somewhat perhaps controversially, that student debt pays for this. I'm not naming any names, apart from MC Hammer and a Ferris wheel. That's from a, a big uh, open source vendor uh, event. If you look at the initial public offerings of some of these companies, then you will see where the money that higher education pays in license fees goes. And it goes. 24% in research and development. That's 24% on the product. 
the rest of what higher education pays for goes on sales and on admin. Interesting, isn't it? Well, I mean, I would say that I'll leave the judgments about morality to, to everybody's individual conscience, but I would say there's something wrong with that picture. And Ben Verdmuller, who uh, was one of the, the founder, in fact, of an environment called ELG, makes the point, in education, government, and anywhere primarily supported by public funding, it makes sense to use software that doesn't lock you in or quietly convert public funds into private equity. And I think that is an incredibly valuable point to take away. And this is what we are precisely not about. So, uh, I'm going to get through this talk really quickly, by the way, so we've got a lot of time for questions and discussion. Um, I want to say something about our priorities, the Perio's priorities. So we're a, a deliberately, lightly staffed, non-profit entity registered currently in North America. We have around 70, 73 members, commercial partners and academic institutions, overwhelmingly academic institutions. And as I mentioned earlier, we work in partnership with other entities with similar missions and similar values. ACE at Portail in France is uh, a similarly 73 institutions, around 80% of French higher education. They work independently, but with the support of the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. The LAMP Consortium, which has nothing to do, confusingly, with the LAMP software stack. It's just a name. Their logo is a LAMP. Uh, they are 23 small institutions who collaborate around open source solutions. And when I say small institutions, I mean the kind of 300 to 1,200 full-time equivalent students, small institutions. I can't talk about all our software communities because that would literally be the morning gone. As I said, we've grown from being a small number of software communities to being 17. I want to mention four uh, specifically, but I'll explain why I find this interesting. I'm referring to these software communities from their point of origin now. Karuta, if you've not heard of it, is a next generation e-portfolio solution. It's being developed by a partnership of HSA Montreal, business school in Montreal, an engineering school in the University of Grenoble, and Kyoto University. It's a relatively new project. It's three or four years old. That was born within a period. It's difficult to think of how those precise parts of three institutions would have found one another had it not been for a period. So I think that's a, a positive story. And that's one point of origin. Incidentally, the uh, Karuta is really taking off in parts of the world. It's taking off big time in France. Uh, and the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research have made a significant amount of funding available for Karuta to be hardened, to, be, to run at scale. We usually have either quite prosaic names like Ontask or Japanese names like Sakai and Karuta for our projects. Uh, anybody know what language Foisan is? It's Scots Gaelic. So, Faisan is a project which is starting, uh, or has been started, sorry, by the University of Edinburgh. The University of Edinburgh, large, prestigious institution in Scotland, um, has been a long time consumer, if you like, of open source software. But Faisan, which is about providing uh, a backbone to communicate with students for emergency communications, but not only for emergency communications, a coherent, holistic way of communicating with students at an infrastructure level. This is a, a project which they're not consuming. It's a project which they've started as an institution to meet their own needs. But they want to approach sustainability of the software by making it open source and encouraging others to participate. And that is beginning to happen. 
on task, which I think we're going to hear some more about uh, later today from its principal, Abelardo Pardo, who is at uh, South Australia in Adelaide, uh, is a way, uh, on task is handling the problem of personalizing mass communications with students at scale. It's got the learning analytics label attached to it. Uh, it's not predictive analytics. It's working on a rules-based system. Uh, it's got some serious adoption in Australia. But its point of origin is from the, oops, point of origin is from SOLA, from the Society for Learning Analytics Research, and some of the SOLA leadership. So it's interesting to see a different point of origin for some software coming into uh, Aperio. You may have heard of uh, Equella. Uh, Open Equella is a repository solution. Its origin was in Australia, in fact in Tasmania, and for many years it was owned by Pearson, obviously a major international publisher. Pearson were rationalizing their portfolio of software products and they considered closing Equala as it then was down. But instead of doing that, we managed to persuade them, there's a substantial community of use there, by the way, some 60 or 70 institutions worldwide use Equala, uh, open Equala now. Uh, we managed to persuade them, after a fairly lengthy process, to make the software open source. And we went through all the legal hurdles that we had to do for that. So in these four projects, you've got four very different points of origin, and it speaks to the diversity, I think, of the Aperio community. Some of our key priorities for the coming year are around partnership and advocacy. We need to equip our community to be better advocates. Uh, we need to help articulate a rational cloud strategy. Uh, there is uh, a buzz phrase in North America, which is cloud first. So you examine a cloud solution first and you move on to other solutions second. That very easily turns into cloud only. And if you think about one of those reasons I mentioned when I began speaking about why institutions choose open source software, and it being partly about control and higher education controlling its own destiny, it's easy to see how a, a cloud strategy which is not carefully considered could close down those avenues of control and could close down innovation. So really, I increasingly personally think of this as making a distinction between core and chore. Chore stuff infrastructure. It makes sense to share. It might make sense to share an above campus level between institutions. Core stuff, the mission stuff, is what we should be focused on and where innovation is particularly needed. And that can be done on a common back, uh, back end infrastructure or it can be done on uh, an institutional back end infrastructure. I think we're going to be about very much in the, in the coming year about increasing and stimulating investment in our software communities. Higher ed does not invest enough in solutions which meet its needs, and we need to up our game on that. We need to build out a period of membership. I've mentioned some of our partnerships, but we need to explore other areas for partnership. We are not going to solve the metaphorical world hunger on our own. We should be modest. We should work with others and collaborate. I think we are going to see a growth in new models of shared services. ASA Portai, the French consortium that I mentioned, uh, provides certain software for France, for higher education in France. And institutions collaborate and share the services that they provide. Similarly, uh, not a formal partner, but a group that we're in dialogue with in British Columbia, BC Campus, have a whole bunch of common infrastructure that they buy in 
and build on, and they build open soft software on top of it. And as long as you stick to common standards and common specifications, you can move away from that if you want to. But they're finding it particularly effective. And they were driven to it, incidentally, initially, several years ago, by uh, a concern around data privacy. Uh, and in particular, Canada has always had strong data privacy legislation. And so they were not happy about buying in solutions that, that might be based in the United States because it would break Canadian law. And LAMP, that group of small colleges, small institutions in North America, buy open source hosted solutions. Hosted solutions but with the extra guarantees that open source can bring. I mentioned uh, data privacy. We have to I think constantly review what we do in the light of new developments. Privacy, incidentally, Educores, that group in North America I mentioned, uh, survey IT leaders every year and produce this top 10 issues list. Two years ago, privacy was nowhere in that list. This year it came in at number three. And we have to think about privacy and the ethical use of our software continually. An initiative last year, the Ethical Operating System Toolkit, uh, we are weaving into our incubation process so that our software communities, as they begin to form, consider the uses of the, of the software and the potential uses and the potential misuse and abuse of software from an early stage. And it's easy to see in some of these areas how our learning analytics work, for example, uh, is, uh, this is this is pretty essential to that work. I want to close early by thanking people for, from Africa for their contributions. Berta and Francois, both board members of Aperio, elected last year. Sam, who as well as organizing this event to a considerable degree, serves on our incubation working group. And I want to make the point that we're a community which is built largely out of voluntary contributions. We work together to keep money inside higher ed, to keep resources inside higher ed. And the only way we can do that is by encouraging uh, a culture of contribution. Uh, thanks to our African member institutions. I think we're going to be adding one to that list in the near future. And a big thanks to Open Colab, our commercial partner, who have organized this event and do so much for our community, both here uh, and globally. And so, I always end with an advert. It's not too late to consider attending our main international conference. It's a long way away for you. I do realize that. Uh, yeah, that's what, two 12-hour flights. Wow. Uh, early June, best place to get to know our community, best place to find out and talk to people who are active in those software communities that I've mentioned and many that I have not mentioned. Uh, my best advice would be if you want to do that, get the visa application in early. It seems to be getting harder and harder to travel. But with that, I'm going to stop and ask for questions, contributions, thoughts about what I've said, questions about what I've not said. But thank you very much for listening. So, 20 minutes for questions. Yeah. Can now.
Well, I think there are several parts to that. Um, I mean, first of all, the guy who used to be in charge of Sakai at NYU said, we're spending the same amount of money as we would on a commercial proprietary license. The difference is we're spending it on product improvement, and NYU's version of Sakai doesn't look five years out of date. They're, they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is, and they're collaborating with others, other, others in the community to ensure that the product remains fresh and moving forward. The foundation doesn't direct the development of any of our software pieces. So the foundation does not determine the direction of Sakai. The Sakai Project Management Committee determines the direction of Sakai, and that's built of volunteers across the community from Commercial, uh, commercial partners from academic institutions, and doc, Dr. Chuck chairs that. Uh, if it's a choice of putting money into retaining capacity and improving a product determined by your agenda, and taking a commercial proprietary system off the shelf, I know which one's got more future in it. A commercial proprietary vendor, for example, which is still not making a profit. It's, it's quite an odd set of circumstances. But we believe pretty firmly that by collaborating in the way that NYU do and making sufficient internal investment, we can do products that are world beating. Now, the advocacy piece that I mentioned is really not about entirely about ensuring that um, we get more members or more institutions adopt our software. It's as much as, as much as that is actually about equipping you with the arguments that win investment in your institutions and help senior managers understand why it's necessary to make that investment. So it's not an easy answer. I hope it's some kind of an answer. Uh, the foundation, incidentally, as I said, deliberately does not set down roadmaps for our software. We think it's better for people who are closer to the problem to solve the problem. What we try to do is provide an enabling framework that those software communities can all draw on. And where it makes sense, we do common services, so it makes sense to manage intellectual property centrally. It used to make sense to do a lot of technical infrastructure centrally. That's not quite the same anymore. But we, you know, and community infrastructure, that kind of thing. But we, we don't, and we deliberately don't drive product roadmaps. So, as I say, I hope that's answered some of your thoughts.
Anyone else? Stephen. So I'm wondering, you used the case of NYU, and we've seen a lot of um, activity and contribution from NYU, and they, they specifically are investing a lot of development costs. And I'm wondering, if you look at that 24% of a commercial entity operating in the space as R&D, how universities adopting open source like rate on that scale of for example, and you said, okay, we have an open source product of a particular type and a comparable commercial equivalent would cost us X. Are we as universities putting in 25% roughly of that level into software R&D, either internally or by contracting people to do development? So I, I suspect sort of there is a trap that we can fall into where we say, fantastic, we have no license costs for this product, so our implementation costs are very low, but in fact that's not a sustainable 10-year horizon on it. And the, you know, at the point where people adopt open source, one should really say you should peg your level of investment, even though it's a voluntary investment and you can spend it in any way you like, but at least that 25% of an equivalent commercial cost to keep the investment sustainable and tackle the next generation challenges. I, I couldn't agree more, and it's why I, I specifically tagged that in the in the advocacy slide. Um, I do think that there is a tendency at a senior level in institutions which adopt open source to see the freedom from licensing cost part, but not see the corollary about needing to invest collectively in the software. In some places, you do find a low level of investment and a reliance on others to do the work for them, the tragedy of the commons. And I think we need to ramp up our advocacy and we need to ramp up understanding that exactly the kind of investment level that you mentioned, except of course it wouldn't be 25%, it would be like 100%. Uh, we need to make sure that we get adequate investment levels from institutions which adopt our software. And I think I note a growing willingness to do that but it's an area that we need a phenomenal amount of work on we need to get much better at it I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that the posited greater flexibility of the future environment means it's going to be more adaptable to your needs, but you need to articulate those needs in advance and plan around it. You know, nobody in this room is an Aperio customer. We don't have customers. Open Car Lab have customers that they sell services to. We don't have customers. We're a community of institutions and other organizations which work together to help higher ed solve its problems. But I, I couldn't agree more. Good comment. Thank you. 
are saying, as we investigate, it's difficult for us to participate in the community where we are involved. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Most. Uh, and, and institutions do have significant differences. I mean, th that, I think, is part of the point of the NGDLE, that we want eventually to have the degree of flexibility that makes it easier for you to meet the needs of your, your students. That's been the direction of travel for some time. Some of the stuff that Dr. Chuck is going to talk about later around LTI Advantage and some of the standards and specifications that are developing are going to make it easier to do that. But, um, I mean, all I can say is articulate the requirements and engage the community and make absolutely sure that nobody else wants them because you might find they do. But I appreciate the difficulty of being a large institution in South Africa that is very different from other institutions. Uh, all I can say is that I think the direction of travel, which you know you help by your participation, is leading to a degree of flexibility that will enable you to meet needs better. And in the future, um, perhaps more appropriately than a commercial proprietary solution. So maybe a, a question is, are there other universities in the community that are like us? Are there other major universities where you have all students online that are sitting in your foundation that we can maybe to understand to what degree there's no institution of the size of UNISA that is wholly online in our, in our community. There are lots of institutions which are beginning to deliver more and more wholly online. Uh, and that, I think, is the, the kind of segment of our community that I would make a draw a bead on, I would get close to. Get close to. But we're, I mean, to say we're, we're 70 odd members, uh, there's great diversity in our membership. You know, we've got schools like NYU, we have national agencies like SWITCH in Switzerland and JISC in, in the UK, we have large institutions, and we have also some of those very small institutions as partners that I mentioned. So there's a lot of diversity there, but I don't think there's anything quite l that looks like UNISA. I would, be, I, I would be asking questions on lists about which institutions we're using Sakai for wholly online. And for that matter, other software that we steward, not just Sakai. I would be engaging the community and asking who's working on that. And I'm pretty sure, I'm highly confident you would get responses that might be helpful. Five minutes. I'm not standing between people and coffee, am I? No. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we've already talked about it. I mean, I think we're going to move away from systems to support learning, which are monolithic, which have a limited set of functions, <coughs> many of which faculty don't use or students don't use. Um, I think we've got work to do to articulate needs, perhaps start thinking in discipline-specific terms about what we need and move away from this general one-size-fits-all environment and perhaps move to have an environment which is more flexible and more adaptable to a specific discipline, more adaptable to a specific purpose like wholly online learning. But I think that the, the, if I could sum it up, I would say the future is flexible or certainly I think that's the way it has to be. And it's why, you know, with 17 different software communities inside a period, I think we can make a unique contribution to, to that. If you look at some of the software, like Karuta that I mentioned, it does not look like a traditional e-portfolio solution. It is highly configurable, highly flexible, much more user-friendly, and not designed for one specific e-portfolio e purpose. 
And that, I think, is a small kind of harbinger of, of where, we're, where we're heading. I mean, also, I mean, to be fair, to say, I mean, Stephen was here yesterday afternoon talking about, talking about Opencast. Opencast is used at massive scale by uh, institutions like the University of Manchester. I mean, I've not spoken to Stuart lately, Stephen, but I mean, it's tens of thousands of hours a year captured. They mandated lecture capture. You had to opt out of it. Uh, and they, they run stuff at very, very significant scale. So it's that combination of scalability and flexibility that I think is the line of march, is the direction that we, we're headed in. Okay, thank you, Adam. Okay, um, just a couple of logistics issues for recording and streaming. So I think we're going to close these two back doors uh, because of recording sessions, because they're sort of in the camera eye line, so they're a bit distracting if you look at the recordings. And there is an entrance at the back there, which you can move in and out of. So when the sessions are running, then please use the back entrance. We'll close these. Um, the recordings generally will not pick up uh, questions asked from the audience. So if you're a speaker, then please just repeat the, the key part of the question so we get that captured well for the recording. Um, and the other small bit is that we put a new camera in for live streaming and a better picture, but if you're right up there at the front, the camera angle is not that good. So if you're a presenter, just sort of stay a little bit further towards the back. Um, we just noticed that recently. Okay, so... We are just getting set up. Um, our live stream is running, so let me welcome virtually everybody who is tuned into the live stream from the Emerge Africa Network and anybody else who's joined us via social media. And we have a back channel. Um, who's running our back channel? Sam? Um, there is Nicola in the room. Um, Nicola, right. Okay, so Nicola will relay questions from um, live streaming back channel participants at the end of the session. And how are we for time? I want to start early. Hmm? What's the time? Oh, it is 9.30. Exactly. Well, 9.28. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, um, Sukena Olji, to all of you. Um, Sukena has been with SALT in different capacities, in fact, since about 2014 and is a fine example of open practice and somebody who embodies openness because she, in fact, started blogging and tweeting while she was doing her master's in open and distance learning through the Oxford University um, and Open University, sorry. And that sort of brought us, brought her into our orbit in SALT and she joined us um, <coughs> working on a number of different projects over the years, including uh, our MOOCs project, the Open Education Resources for Development project, um, and more recently, Unbundling project. And now she's moved into the probably most challenging <laughs> assignment of our time with us, which is as uh, sort of manager and strategist, really, for online, um, fully online programs at the University of Cape Town. And, Colleagues from UNISA and Northwest probably roll their eyes when we at UCT talk about online because this is a much newer thing for us, but it's also been an area of significant change and evolution and turbulence really in the higher education landscape. And I think that discussions around online program are challenging mainstream education provision and undergraduate face-to-face -face education provision in ways that we haven't seen recently. So uh, although online programs are, are for UCT are still relatively small numerically, they present a, an outsized challenge and many new questions about the form of education and the platforms and systems and mechanisms to go around with that. So, so Kenna is our, our lead um, uh, adventurer, in a sense, in online programs for the University of Cape Town, and it's my pleasure to introduce her to uh, deliver this keynote on uh, the unbundling project and 
digital technology and emerging models in unequal landscapes. So thank you. Over to you, Sukena. Great. Just hold it. Okay. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Right. So good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Congratulations to everyone who's organised this conference, and especially a shout out to my colleague Sam and Stephen for all your role in putting this together. It looks like a great conference programme. So before I start talking, and given that it's relatively early on in the conference, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you or behind you or in front of you and tell them what you consider could be meant by the unbundled university or the unbundling university. And at the same time, if you don't know them, introduce yourself, but also Tell them what keeps you awake at night in your job. Um, so getting up to watch Game of Thrones doesn't count, but anything else that uh, keeps you up. So I'm just going to give you a, a minute. Uh, just quickly turn to somebody. Let's get a bit warmed up. Okay, um, if you could just complete your conversation, although I feel like I should let people continue. Okay, um, I think your minute is up. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Thank you for um, just taking a, a moment. Hold those thoughts. We might come back to them later. So this morning, um, I'm going to draw on the findings of a research project that I've been involved with for the past two years. It's called the Unbundled University, Researching Emerging Models in an Unequal Landscape. I'm part of a larger research team um, and we've been looking into this over the past two years. The project is in collaboration with UCT and with the University of Leeds. Um, it's led by our SORT director, Laura Chenovitz, and Neil Morris from Leeds, they're the PIs. And we have been looking at um, how, um, through digitization, what are the um, emergent models of teaching and learning that are emerging in higher education? And um, one, and it's funded by the National Research Council and the UK's um, Economic and Social um, Research Council. However, for me, and I think for most of my colleagues in this project, this isn't just a research project or something that's been abstract. The issues, conversations, and implications of the increasing disaggregation of educational provision into, and our definition here, into its component parts, um, and delivery by uh, multiple stakeholders using digital appro approaches is something that is very much, well, part of my, de definitely part of my, my job and increasingly part of my, uh, the, my colleagues in SILT. Um, and, some of, and it's some of these issues that are keeping me awake at night. And uh, maybe as I go through, um, it'll become a bit clearer. The project website is there, un unbundleduni.com. So I'll be. Uh, looking a little bit at some of, uh, firstly, just uh, what the focus of the project is, and then I will share some findings, which I think will hopefully be the you know, really interesting bit. Um, and the project, just to say, is um, looking at both higher education in South Africa and higher education in England. 
Um, so when we first started thinking about emerging models of teaching and learning, and you know where this idea for this um, project came from, it was in response to what we were seeing in our work as people working in higher education, um, working in teaching and learning, working in blended online digital education. Um, and so the affordances of digital technologies, as we all know, um, is around um, increased flexibility, um, uh, scale, and access. But what we also found was a, a useful lens was thinking about marketization. Um, how marketization, and I'll define that a little bit further, is impacting on um, these emerging teaching and uh, learning models. And then we so, uh, found that one of the f very useful frames and lenses that people have started talking about is around the notion of unbundling. And, and again, um, our definition of unbundling is around disaggregation of, 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 what, of how teaching and learning is delivered. So it's this intersection that we were interested in um, exploring. But we also are mindful that we are operating in a broader context of inequality and growing inequalities, um, both in um, you know, our, our, our country, our society, South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world, but also the university system in which we operate in South Africa is highly stratified. Um, traditionally, um, we have institutions that were, were previously um, uh, advantage institutions or disadvantage institutions, all mergers, and those um, inequalities are still playing out in a stratified centre. And we were interested and wanting to explore what this intersection is doing around inequalities in the system. So that's the um, that's the kind of framing in which we we went ahead. So why and how is unbundling happening? Um, and and so I've. I'll go, this presentation is split into two parts now. I'm going to set the scene for a little while and examine some of the global trends in the landscape. And in the second part, I'll talk about the research findings, specifically in relation to South Africa. I won't really have time to go into the English um, context. So forces shaping teaching and learning provision, and this was, has, was alluded to in um, Ian's presentation previously, but also some of the questions around austerity. Um, and lack of investment in higher education. So worldwide universities, um, especially since 2008 crash, um, are having to look at new ways of bringing in um, income or new ways of, of funding. Um, and that has um, led to universities having to cut costs, but also look at other forms of sustaining the um, academic project um, and, the, and the university. I talked a little bit about digitalization and marketization. I'll um, explore that. Now, so although it's unequally distributed, more people are interacting digitally for all sorts of things, communications, shopping, banking, and in our context, and particularly with cell phones. And higher education has also changed as a result of digital technology. Teaching and learning spaces are being designed to incorporate technology, such as um, interactive presentation boards, laptops, microphones, lecture capture. and. All of this is impacting on the range of possibilities for classroom teaching. Most universities are likely to have learning management systems or, um, and, 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 and uh, applications built into that. And there has been major advancements in the provision of education. And online education and digital technology, per the purposes are varied, but increasingly higher education institutions, as well as supporting classroom teaching, are looking at how to support continuing professional development, how to accredit learning outside of the institution, lifelong learning, widening or um, increasing access and, and enhancing the quality of teaching, and also to support the huge um, trend of massification, which is the increasing entrance of more and more people into the higher education system. And this timeline here um, quite nicely illustrates some of those um, forces. We can see that um, online education, blended education, is emanating both from open and distance education um, institutions and also the, uh, the top line, which is face-to-face -face teaching, so more traditional institutions. And it's the stuff in the middle that's really interesting. And it's what's um, 
what, where, where our attention has been drawn in terms of this particular study, what's happening, this is where unbundling is happening. And here are some of the players. So we had um, open educational resources movement around uh, materials. Um, you could argue, uh, though not, uh, that this led to kind of uh, you know massive open online courses. Um, we've had open uh, universities moving into um, uh, more online blended forms, and uh, this may you know you, we could argue probably at length around the significance of MOOCs in this, but certainly they've had a catalyzing effect um, in terms of attention to online um, and online uh, learning, and especially drawn the attention of um, previously face-to-face -face or traditional universities. And then a, a, the evolution from the MOOC platforms of these various forms of micro-credentials, so you might have heard of nano-degrees and micro-credentials. Um, and then as more institutions have, have moved across the continuum from face-to-face -to, -face to more blended and online, we've seen the entry of um, businesses and enabling companies and, and what are at the moment, the term of the moment is um, online program management companies who are now providing services. So we've got platforms and companies and it's this grey area in the middle that's become very interesting. Okay. So while um, that's been happening, it's been happening within universities, but as I said, it's also the entrance of other players. And this is where our interest in marketization has, um, was around this other lens. So the view of higher education as being for the public good, I would argue is being has always been increasingly replaced by market-driven views, which are emphasizing value for money and efficiencies. Um, you know, we hear discourses about whether going to university is worth it. Um, for students in terms of costs, whether it's worth it in terms of families um, and, and what they will get out of it. Um, and this is underpinned, as I mentioned earlier, by massification, so a huge growth in demand in higher education, particularly in the last 30 years, especially in developing countries. So more and more people um, want access to higher education. Um, um, but there has been, as I said earlier, a reduced spend um, from the public sector on the sta state willing to fund higher education. Um, and this has led to mechanisms for funding. So um, in the United Kingdom, um, or in England um, specifically, because uh, the Scottish and Welsh systems are different, um, fees are currently just under £10,000 a year. Um, and in South Africa, fees have, have been increasing approximately 9% year on year in the period 2010 to 2017. We saw um, the impact of that in the um, Feasance Fall protests 2015 to 2017. Um, so fees has been a mechanism for universities to, um, to uh, for sustainability. So the cost of funding higher education has spread to students and families. And another um, area for um, income generation is around generating third stream revenue. Um, and in all of this, universities are now in this, you could argue, a kind of more marketized, corporatized environment around competition rankings and reputation um, in systems amongst each other as well as global rankings. So those are the kinds of sort of mark, you know, you could argue, and it's uh, that um, to some extent, um, the higher education systems are increasingly influenced by and have become marketized. Um, so what is mark how, how can we explain types of marketization and market making? This was what we were particularly interested before we started um, doing our kind of data collection. So um, we found this um, distinction from Bald and Udell and the um, references there, and I'll share these slides later, around two different forms of privatization or marketization. So the first is endogenous um, privatization where it's around bringing the language and practices of the market into public education. So for example, we see this where the language of business is pervading institutions, including measurements, metrics, tracking, um, accountability, those kinds of, kind of business language in our institutions. Considering students as consumers buying a product is a form of an endogenous um, uh, marketization um, approach. 
So those are the kinds of things. The other form is exogenous, where it's around using the market for public education needs. And it's where public education is opened up to the private sector part, um, for private sector participation on a for-profit basis, and where the private sector is invited to deliver some parts of public education. And it's this exogenous privatization that we were particularly interested in, um, in terms of how teaching and learning provision and these new models, um, that grey area that I mentioned before, that those appear to be forms of exogenous um, privatisation. So that's what we were interested in exploring. Education as a business um, is something that is um, uh, talked about. I mean, it's still debatable um, whether it's, it can ever be um, purely a business, but certainly investment in educational technology and edtech has increased. And 2018, global investment in um, edtech was 4.46 billion US dollars. Um, we uh, universities have been uh, buying uh, for uh, you know licensed deals for LMSs, um, tools, products um, for a very long time. But what's different, I think, or what's em emergent as, uh, has emerged is of new companies and I'm um, of on of these online ma program management companies, OPMs sometimes called edu businesses or enabler companies, and which are providing quite um, different types of um, services to universities. And this is um, f uh, from the work of Phil Hill and Michael Feldstein um, from spring 2018. And this is um, just describing some of the, these companies, they're named, and what sort of services they're providing for teaching and learning provision, specifically around online uh, degrees and online education, so the former what would be considered the core business of a university. So I'm going to go a little bit more granular now and just talk a little bit about how unbundling um, is actually happening. Um, so a number of commentators from the business world have talked about unbundling the university degree itself. So this is the work from Michael Statton. Um, looking at disaggregating the university degree. So this is adapted from some of his work, but it's the argument effectively is that you can disaggregate different elements of what somebody is buying from an online degree, and that you could then decide what bits could be outsourced or privatized for cost or efficiency reasons. And the one argument is that the you could, you could for a lower cost or more efficiency or a different type of uh, profit, um, provide the same kind of um, experience so for reasons of efficiency. So that kind of unbundling of the degree conversation has been happening. Um, what we're also interested in um, is this is, the la this is a landscape of how what a university might be um, how a university might see what it produces. So here we've got um, landscape, of course, provision. Um, this row here is around the formal degree. Um, so this is your credit-bearing qualifications. Your conventional mode of delivery might be um, your, your campus-based teaching, lectures. But as you move along this flexibility, you've got more blended in online courses, but, and to the point where your entire degree can be offered online. Um, universities don't only do formal um, qualifications, they may do semi-formal, which are short certificate courses, continuing um, uh, lifelong learning, continuing development, so they're not credit-bearing, but they are certificate-bearing, and again, you can move across that so that there's more and more offered online. Non-formal also, um, where you ha uh, universities have public outreach, public lectures, summer school, for example, and we and MOOCs kind of sit in this space here. You can argue that they're, pub they're a, a public outreach. But what's interesting is that in this space, and it's that gray area I mentioned earlier, all sorts of new types of um, products are possible. And what we found in our study is the formation of different types of business relationships with private companies to design and deliver teaching and learning. And in particular, uh, micro-credentials is a very interesting area. So this is um, a report from Class Central, which is an online course aggregator. And you might have, if, if you're at, at all involved in, in the MOOC environment or you've been working with MOOCs, um, all these kind of funny types of micro-credentials are emerging, nano-degrees, micro-masters, um, specializations. And I would argue that MOOC providers have been at the forefront of imagining new types of credentials as the MOOC 
business model searches for sustainability and profitability. So, for example, Coursera, which is the largest MOOC provider, has uh, something like, at the moment, 3,200 um, standalone courses, 300 specializations, which are a form of um, uh, pathways of courses um, that is a little, more, little bit more formal than standalone courses, um, a number of master track or professional certificates, which is like one above, which includes formal teaching and is a higher price point, as well as degrees. So you can see that there's a kind of, no, not only as a pathway, but also as a system um, around stackability. So micro-credentials, again, this is like unbundling and rebundling, because these are generally done with um, universities and so universities are offered um, these kinds of models um, around stackability you know thinking through and imagining new types of ways of offering different educational opportunities so it's one thing to offer micro credentials but it's another thing that they are accepted but there are some very interesting trends uh, around how micro credentials are are becoming increasingly accepted there's a few examples there um, for example New Zealand has recently agreed a, nationally, a national system for the accreditation of micro-credentials. And just very recently, India's Swayamnet platform, which is a, 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 a platform that's um, nationally supported that offers MOOCs, will allow students to study MOOCs for university credit. So again, you can see there's a kind of articulation um, and a sort of unbundling and rebundling into the degree. And there's some other examples there as well. So. How do these partnerships and business relationships actually work? So imagine that, um, let's imagine that a university wants to put together a fully online degree. Um, and these are the stages that um, it might go through. So if you take the various activities that a university might operate with, you can see that you could unbundle them, hence the little spaces. So let's start with readiness. So a university who might not have done th this before has to go through uh, what I've called, what we've called a readiness phase, um, which is really the preparation. It's understanding what's required, and that might be the need for new systems and technology platforms. There may be issues around governance and accreditation. And there may be market scanning and understanding what the business models are. So all of these um, are possible discrete tasks that the universities might not have done before. Um, the second level is around program level planning. So imagine, it, remember, this is around uh, um, creating a, a new um, online program or series of programs. So there's a whole bunch of tasks that, need, um, that a university might go through. So there might be a selection of programs, um, need for accreditation. There's probably at this stage going to be market research and marketing specific um, programs and degrees, as well as, as marketing and admissions. So all of those are discrete tasks. And then it's at the course design. Um, and this has, um, these, these are the kind of things that universities um, might do themselves, which is around um, actually making the courses. So it's designing courses in online and blended environments, um, including materials, assessment design, building onto the platform, um, testing, quality assurance, all of these stages. Then if you're going online, it's around delivery. Um, so it's around how the teaching is done, how tutoring, facilitation, assessment, um, administration, analytics, all of these are discrete um, tasks. And then in the online spaces, there are other um, student support becomes very important. So there may be student help desks or 24-7 or whatever, you know, office hours for online student support. And then we've got evaluation and maintenance. And the point of thinking about breaking this down is that any of these can be unbundled in the sense that what we're finding is that more and more this can be unbundled within a, an institution, but it can also more likely that because it, universities are not used to doing this or perhaps don't have the systems, there is the opportunity for private sector entrants or private companies to actually create business models around very specific elements such as student help desk or around um, analytics or around production. And so this is where the unbundling and rebundling we found was happening uh, when we were doing you know, scans of the, the landscape. So this is, from an institutional point of view, how you might fund 
internal capacity development for online and blended learning. And this is, if you're a university who is in the process of going online. So one option is, is in-house provision um, completely, which is predominantly in-house production and delivery, where you build an in-house capacity unit that can do all of that. Um, what we found in, in our findings was that um, this is quite difficult for universities um, uh, for all sorts of reasons. It was alluded to earlier that this requires significant investment. And so there are emerging funding models, but we have said you know, there's two main ones. So there's one which is fees for services, where a university might have some in-house um, and they will buy particular services and on a pick and mix basis and you know rebundle those together with more control there's also the full service partnership model which is really what the um, OP opm companies um, have been offering which is that a private company invests in a university's online education venture in return for a profit share um, and the model particularly focuses on, on marketable online courses and programs so those it's a quick summary of some of the funding models Okay, so that's a kind of scan of the types of um, concepts and um, the, what the landscape looks like when we looked at it from how our universities, higher education institutions going online and, and bringing in some of the global trends. So what I'll do now is I'm going to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we did. And I'm focusing on who the stakeholders are in this, in this environment and who is unbundling and rebundling higher education provision. So the research study, as I mentioned, um, has been, uh, is, 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 is still ongoing, but we have, um, we've started re uh, sharing the findings. Um, and in this particular um, slot, I'm going to just talk about what are the relationships between universities and private companies, and also how do different stakeholders understand unbundling and rebundling, and these emergent forms of teaching and learning provision. So just to let you know, our sample was six universities in South Africa, um, with that uh, breakdown, three historically advantaged, two historically advantaged institutions with historically disadvantaged sites, and one historically disadvantaged institution. I'm not going to talk about the English ones there. Methods were we used publicly available information to do the initial mapping, which I'll show you, and then we interviewed um, 33 policymakers and senior decision makers, so that's um, people in departments of higher education, vice chancellors and deputy vice chancellors, and we interviewed CEOs or senior executives in private companies. We also ran a focus groups with 44 academics and um, nine professionals that were supporting online education, such as learning designers and educational technologists. We also conducted student surveys. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about those for time, but we we did talk, um, we did have some student data. So I'm going to talk about mapping. So what we did was we tried to see what does this landscape look like in South Africa. I'm just going to, and we, we scraped this data from websites, university websites, private company websites, press releases, and media to come up with a picture. So I'm now going to do the scary thing of swapping. Okay, so, okay. See where that is. Okay. Oh, it worked earlier. Okay. Okay. Awkward silence moment. Okay. I don't know whether you can help me, right? We did test this earlier, but uh, sod's law. Yeah. Okay, so that's that. No, 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 no. Come back. Come back, come back. Oh, oh. I want to show this website here. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, can I get rid of this thing? Okay. All right. So... Um, this is a map, um, and it will move in a minute, so, um, where we took every, each South African university, um, which is represented by a round circle, and this is all public information, so we have named it, it's not anonymized, and 
Um, the size of the university is based on enrollments. If it's orange, it's more distance. Um, if it's bluey green, it's um, the enrollments are campus-based universities. And then the square blocks are the, the private companies that they have a relationship with. Um, and so if I, and then we have some parameters here. So this is just, um, you know, all the universities and who they have partnerships with. And then we've got some filters here. So if I click on um, institution type, um, it basically um, says, uh, puts all, you know, all the comprehensive universities together, and you can see that's here, and these are the traditional, the research intensive um, universities, and they're here, for example, and you can start seeing some patterns um, around who is partnering with who and for what. And this, um, this is publicly available, so you can go and interrogate it, um, and there's quite rich, there's a whole database behind this, and we've got, um, you know, who's doing MOOCs, who's doing online courses, who's doing online programs um, with these particular companies. So this is not telling you who's doing online courses at all in-house. We're just looking at um, relationships with private companies as a, as a, as a way of looking at um, how the market is influencing um, higher education in South Africa. So we've got this other filter here, which um, is showing that Effectively, what it was showing that the higher ranked institutions are the ones that are being um, approached by private companies for these kinds of um, uh, business arrangements. Um, and so, if we go back to institution type, um, yeah, so we can see that. Um, in terms, so, that generally, what we're finding is that the institutions that are um, were previously um, disadvantaged or are more comprehensive are not really being approached by private companies or are forming these relationships. And that's what we, that, um, we found. Um, so I'm just going to go back to this. Um. Okay. So I have to go back to the whole thing. So what we also found, and that was a snapshot from August 2018, and the landscape has moved on. Uh, we're currently doing an update to include the universities of technology in this um, particular map. Um, that while it's, if we call unbundling as we've defined it, which is partnering um, or unbundling and rebundling with the private companies, is growing rapidly in the South African higher education context. At the moment, we've just looked at public universities. It is happening at some universities and not others. Um, and as I said, pr predominantly at traditional, historically advantaged and high, higher ranked universities. And a handful of um, universities in these categories are dominating the activity. Um, I, there's also a map for England. Um, for reasons of time, I'm not going to show it, but just to say that the prevalence of unbundling is rapidly growing in English higher education context. Also, there are many more universities in England, and the map looks a lot messier. But the private sector is very active in this area, and the relationships with English higher education students are growing and shifting quite rapidly, and against uh, certain types. So that is just a very uh, quick scan of, of, of what's, um, what the bigger picture landscape looks like. So how do people feel about this in um, these institutions? What are the stakeholders' views? And I'm just going to share some of these um, perspectives in the last part of my presentation. So senior decision makers, we're, we're, I'm going to focus on three, three different um, elements, senior decision makers, um, private companies, and academics. So for senior decision makers, their perspectives in relation to the challenges for the university sector um, uh, in terms of uh, all the particular issues was very different, as you can imagine, depending on the university type. Um, there were some who felt, um, with the first quote there, that the university is turning away from its core focus um, when engaging with um, online blended distance education. Um, but that universities are, are doing this because it's around chasing rankings, because everything flows from ranking, everything. But there were also quite a lot of tensions around surviving austerity and being able to to be responsive to student demands in this context. And so here's someone saying, the biggest problem for me is students not eating. Um, and there were questions around whether um, 
unbundled teaching and learning provision, um, the growth of online blended learning, um, for profit making and with private companies is really core business or whether it's third stream income. Um, and, and what the role of universities was, was to address, whether it was to address inequality as part of core business. However, there was a fair amount of pragmatism with someone saying, I can't see any reason not to use what resources we have to generate as much in money as we can to do the main business as long as it's going to, as long as it's going to promote the mis main mission of the university. In relation particularly to these new uh, models of teaching and learning and unbundled and rebundled provision, there was quite a lot of mixed knowledge about what it meant, what it, what it could do. Um, there was a general um, uh, uh, discussion around what it could do. So someone there saying, once you've got something good online, you can extend it to the popula population of students you don't have on campus because the campus is full. Um, Someone else saying, if you get online right, e even while giving it lots of resources, you can make lots of money, and um, you can make money, you can divert other things. So this was a theme that, that came up. And again, I mentioned pragmatic approaches. There, there, this was quite prevalent, that we don't have the capacities or the infrastructure to do this alone, but the clause is inherited here, it, um, inserted here, re relating to a particular contract with a private company, so that in three to five years' time, we have the capacity to go completely in-house if we desire. So those were some of the perspectives when we spoke to senior decision makers. We talked to private companies. These were CEOs or senior executives. Um, five were working in South Africa or were making plans to do so. And given the global nature of these edu businesses, some were working in both South Africa and England, which was quite interesting. Just a note here to say that South African universities are a relatively early stage of engagement for credit-bearing programs although some have more experience in the short course and MOOC space at the time of interview. So responses and experiences of private companies need to be seen in this light. But private companies' perspectives focus for, uh, very clearly on the importance of a university's brand, rankings, and reputation as factors for how a course or program would be attractive to a market and was a key rationale for seeking a partnership. Um, and that there was a lot of conversation about building trust with university senior leaderships. There were discourses of partnerships rather than buyer-seller relationships. Um, so the one executive saying it's almost as if universities have become stale and now all of a sudden with the advent of online, the ability to consume something instantly from anywhere in the world offers more opportunities. And then the value proposition of these private companies for universities um, was articulated in these, this type of way that the institutions are able to work with nimble providers who give them the opportunity to experiment with new formats of education and then incorporate these learnings back into their overall mission. Um, there were some quite interesting views about working with universities and um, being slow, lacking capacity and agility. Um, these quotes are a bit on the extreme end, but they were there, um, with one executive saying, just to be quite blunt with you, sometimes it feels like taking candy from a child when you negotiate with higher education institutions. They are clueless about how capitalism works. They will enter into agreements blind to be taken for a ride. Um, and there's someone else here talking about their ideal partner or a university is our ideal partner would be commercially focused with some background in online distance learning, but not too much. So they would listen to our advice rather than think they know all the answers. So those are some perspectives. Um, and then there was a theme around championing the students. So the private companies um, felt that the students needed more career-focused, schools-focused opportunities than were being provided at the moment, and that private companies considered themselves as brokering relationships between universities, new students, and industry. And that profit-making was particularly couched in terms of new markets of students as well as industry. So those are some of the quotes. I'll just read the the last one there, that the demands are there from the employer base to, say, train people in different ways. Are your degrees still fit for purpose? So those were some of private company perspectives. And lastly, just focus on academics and the educators. Um, here, um, the understanding around unbundling, the, un the experience of having worked in blended online was quite variable, but there was generally some skepticism, skepticism about the changing nature and purpose of the university in the light of all these sort of new opportunities and new models. Um, someone there saying there is a kind of naive, I think there's a romance with the thing in itself, that this, this technology, it makes us look clever and wonderful, so some skepticism there. 
Um, other academics were just saying, well, then we've got a whole lot of other things to worry about. Um, and uh, and th this kind of technology invisibilizes the real issues on campus and keeps everyone kind of far away from the learning. And then somebody else saying quite starkly, where's the push coming from? Not us, not the students. An external third force who has an affiliation with an internal powerful force. There were positive ex views and experiences um, of, uh, with academics and blended online learning, although sometimes this was just blended online learning in general rather than um, an un unbundled partnership. But someone there saying technology becomes part of the conversation and their students are conversing with each other. It's been wonderful because um, the quiet ones are entering stuff and engaging with each other. So that was picking up on some of the affordances of, 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 of online and blended. Um, there was academics that were very concerned about inequality and social justice and the effects of digital education on their students. They were concerned about digital inequalities and the effect that these emerging processes could have on social justice and transformation issues. This came out quite strongly um, and uh, so probably encapsulated in, in someone saying, you can't eat a tablet, referring to um, you know, the very real needs of students on campus and in, in their context. Okay, nearly done. So what are the implications of this? And I'm just going to focus on some of the South African perspectives and maybe we can have a discussion. So there are alignments and contradictions in this emerging space. Um, universities are balancing competing imperatives around core business, um, delivering teaching and learning, and revenue generating opportunities. There were certainly agreements and alignments between companies and senior decision makers about the opportunities and rationale for partnerships and risk taking. Senior decision makers in institutions generally were very pragmatic and were uh, quite positive about um, the possibility of, of, of working with um, private companies, uh, notwithstanding some specific issues, but recognized capacity building and agility as, as, as a need. But there were, con there were contestations between decision makers and academics in the way they're in terms of how they saw this playing out, and between companies and academics and educators, with academics feeling a sense of um, agency um, uh, being taken away. And this issues of agency, control, and negotiation um, has come out in the study. Concerns about control of teaching and the academic project. There are connotations of this in terms of outsourcing in the South African environment, which is, um, as we know, um, something that uh, has been part of the discussion since the uh, well, exacerbated in the tw since 2015 fees must fall. Interestingly, the the role of social capital, um, especially around relationships between individuals and private companies and senior decision makers using social capital to enter into negotiations rather than an institutional-led strategy, came up. What was also quite apparent was a lack of knowledge and. and understanding about online education provision in universities, including things like knowing how to negotiate contracts and business arrangements as these new offers are coming in to universities or for universities who would like to be in this space but are not, um, not knowing how to go ahead. But that concerns about market forces steering decisions about teaching and actually what is marketable is what we might produce and that was something that did come out. The framing environment, the regulatory issues, um, uh, senior decision makers felt that the, possibly the current regulatory environment is misaligned with new potential teaching and learning models. Um, there were also, we found, very few incentives for exploiting affordances of emerging models for equity purposes and the public good. We found we didn't find many commons models in this um, study. The current system um, appeared to be pu somewhat punitive towards collaboration between universities in the space for joint degrees, sharing of content, credit transfer, because of the kind of, you know, in sort of stratification, also competitiveness between universities. Um, and that there's a need to understand the nature and amount of capacity building needed in universities to meaningfully engage in these emerging learning teaching models, whether they are mainly in-house or um, with companies. And then just lastly, the risks of digital inequalities. Um, so for students, um, that any, these moves need to be towards levelling playing fields, especially on campus and in terms of devices, data and digital literacies. For educators, this kind of unbundling, this disaggregation, if you remember that uh, diagram where you could uh, unbundle bits of course development, bits of online teaching, has a risk of 
um, allowing new distributed roles in teaching teams, but that also uh, risks um, issues of agency, and some academics may be considered to be more marketable, for instance, in online spaces. So there are some um, issues there. And for both students and educators, the risk of curriculum steering by market forces limiting choice and local relevance, also um, issues around fragmentation of the teaching and learning experience. Um, and for higher education institutions, the risk that op these opportunities may further stratify university systems, which um, are being reshaped in different ways around online education. So here's just some of the concluding issues. These are, this study has opened up more questions, really, than answers. Um, you know, what are the implications in an equal society of unbundling of the university? And how can universities take up opportunities of unbundling enabled by digital technologies? And how can universities better mitigate risks when engaging with unbundled provision and engagement with private companies? Before I take questions, I would just say that um, if you found this interesting, if you'd like to join the discussion, we actually, um, advert, uh, just finished running a MOOC um, on this called The Unbundled University, The Market and Digital Technology on the FutureLearn platform. It's just finished but we will be running it again this year. So if you're interested, you can just go and register and then you'll be um, informed when the next run is. We found it a really a fantastic experience um, where we've shared the findings in a scaffolded way as a learning experience. We've had people from um, over 30 countries come in and participate in the conversation. Um, and we've also kind of in, uh, in response to the work we've been doing written a briefing paper um, Laura Chenovitz, the director of SILT and I about issues with universities and private companies and this has been um, something that we've had really interesting feedback on again it's exploratory it doesn't take a stance it just sets out what the issues are okay thank you